Good afternoon, folks. Colin McNally here. We are just waiting on a few more people coming in um, and then we'll get started. As you already are, you can see you're on. You've muted yourself, um, but you will be muted for the event. Um, we'll use the chat function quite a bit if possible. If you've got any questions or anything you want to ask, just let me know. Um, just stick it in the chat. It'd be good even from the moment if you can. Um, you know, say hello and uh, just let me know who you are and where you come from and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, what your business is. Maybe what you're going to use your business plan for, and then we'll get started as soon as possible. Kieran. Hi, Colin. How are you? Not too bad. Not too yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. Thought I'd just join this one and listen in. Why not? Oh, why not? <laughs> We're just waiting for a few more people to join. I think we've got 14 booked. I think that's what um, I was informed. So that's oh. it. Sounds good. So we just could do a few more coming in. Hi, David. Nice to meet you. Trying to get into the advertising industry. Excellent. Yeah. Big industry. Big industry. What, what, um, what photographs do you take at the moment, David? What kind of sectors do you work in? Yeah, excellent. See, so we're going to use the chat function quite a lot, but I mean, you can also unmute yourself if you've got a question to ask. Um, this is slightly different. Uh, hi, Angela. Um, the this is a slightly different kind of webinar that we, we would normally do. Scottish Business Week ones are more master classes and specific topics, and this one's on business planning. We are running others throughout the week as well. If you want to have a look at them, which um, include the likes of branding, we're also doing succession planning, um, which I'm running as a colleague of mine is doing the other ones. And yeah, they are being recorded just to make you aware. Um, if you want to look back at them at all. Um, for Scottish Business Week. So saying to everybody just as they're coming in, Paul, Angela, uh, Marlon, uh, if you want to just put into the chat who you are and where you're from, what your business is, what you're wanting to the co uh, uh, workshop, that'd be great. Um, Starting to get people in now, that's excellent. Colin, I'm being sick. Where is the chat, please? Um, the chat should be up on the right hand side. So, literally, if you look at the top quarter of your screen, up on the right hand side, there should be a little row of um, icons and the first one's people and then the next one should be chat and the third one should be reactions. As I say, worst comes to worst, just open your mic and let me know. I'm quite happy to speak to people. Um, the only reason for asking for mics to be muted is that it just saves any background noise these days. Hi Fiona, nice to meet you. So yeah, if anybody's up, anybody wants to tell me who they are and what they do and all that kind of thing, um, I'll give you a little bit of background as you're doing that to myself. My name's Colin McNally. I spent the first 12 years of my life working for one of the large drinks company, PLC. Hi, Claire, how are you doing? Um, and Hi. then um, 14 years ago, set up my own um, as financial management consultancy, and we now have a consultancy um, practice, which carries out a range of financial management consulting, a range of webinars and other topics as well. Um, so yes, adding that up, I have been doing this now for 26 years. Some days I feel it more than others.
So we're a couple of minutes past. I'm probably going to make a start now, if that's okay. Hi, Marlon. Yeah. Uh, it's restarting a coaching consultancy. Yeah, after COVID, I can imagine. Yep, every single one of us has been affected as we've had that chat before. Um, it's never an easy one. Hi, Irene. Nice to um, see you on the screen. So, guys, I'm just going to kind of leave this screen and I'm going to move to the slides, which you should all be able to see now. And I'm just going to make a start. So, welcome to the masterclass. Um, as I say, I'm Colin McNally. We run uh, an accountancy and consultancy business. Um, as I say, it's a different format than maybe many of the other workshops that's been run that you may be attending from Business Gateway over the past. But as you can see, this is a much wider Scottish Business Week presentation with a range of our business partners, including Digital Boost, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, South of Scotland Enterprise, and our friends from Skills Development Scotland as well. And it is sponsored by the British Business Bank. Um, so no matter what region you're in in the country, um, there is support there for you. Um, and all I would say is after this, if you've got any questions, go back to your local business gateway or your enterprise agency and have that discussion with them. Um, so literally, we will be starting um, just, just now, if I can just get my slide moving again. There we go. Um, and let's say today we're going to talk about business planning. Um, and it's not just about me sitting here spouting off for the next 15 minutes. After that, there's a good opportunity for the next 45 minutes after that to really for you to ask me questions, as long as it's within the sphere of kind of business planning, financial management, or alternatively, please let us know about anecdotes or things you're doing or why you're needing a business plan, how we can support you in that. So really just get to know you, your business, and what we can do to support you um, in the next hour. Most people will write a business plan for a specific reason. They'll write it to basically get a loan, get a grant, or just consider the direction they wish to go in. And that's probably sometimes where people end writing business plans. They don't, it's put in a drawer, it's put away. They don't ever look at it again. They've got their loan, they've got their grant. But truthfully honest, I think it's maybe time that you relooked at the business plan. Now, you may be about to just start one or you've had one before. But in the end of the day, your business plan isn't just about getting that one thing. It's an ongoing, completely regenerating, continually updating document that basically should help you understand and take your business forward. It's something you go back to. It's something you look at and understand. Have I been successful this year? Did I achieve the aims and goals that I set out? And then on top of that, from a financial point of view, we're looking at turning around and saying, OK, did I meet the financial targets I wanted to be at? Did I meet the number of resources I was going to have? Number of likes on Facebook, the number of people who basically come back into your shop returning clients. The business plan sets out these aims. So what we're going to talk about in the next five, ten minutes or so is business plan structure, what you should include in each section, and really when and how to use a business plan. So as I say, stick questions in the chat, open your mic and just ask me um, whatever works for you. Um, obviously, most of you are, um, I can't now see you all because I'm, I'm basically shrunk my screen. Um, you know, most of you all have basically turned your camera off. It can help basically just from a bandwidth point of view as well. You go onto the internet today, I can guarantee you will find a hundred versions of business plans. You can download them, you can find them. There is one in the Business Gateway website. It's a very good one, which you can utilise. But what I've got in front of you is near enough to kind of this, the template we use for all businesses, no matter if you're a startup or basically you are a very large growing businesses, because at the end of the day, each of you have the same issues to handle when it comes to writing a business plan. You actually don't start at the executive summary. You start at the second part. We'll come back to the executive summary. You know, tell me what your business does. Don't let me try and work it out. 
This is an easy thing you're wanting the reader to read. You're wanting to walk through your business plan, making sure they're wanting, desperately wanting to read on to the next section. So what does your business do? What's the products it sells? What does it actually do for a living? What services does it offer? And who do you sell them to? You know, how long have you been in business? Tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, really get me interested in what you're going to do in terms of you as a business. Section three is details. You know, don't let me have to go and try and look for your website, your Facebook page, your phone number, who the partners are, what your address is. Have it there in front of me. You know, if people have to start kind of going to Google you and try and find you, they're kind of maybe going to kind of go off you pretty quick. So what you're trying to do is make this easy for them. You're making this an easy process to allow you to take forward basically what your business is, is telling the reader of this document. Because as I say, the reader of the document, by this point, you have to admit, may have absolutely no experience, understanding, or even concept of what your business is about. So by the time of section three, you're really having to turn around and explain to them in pretty much layman's English what your business does and the basic details of it. Section four is about you and your staff and your background of your business. You know, not everybody coming into business has run a business before. So what you're turning around and making sure that you go over to the reader what is my experience in life? What was my experience in my last job? Why do I want to start this business? What experiences, even though I'm about to go into a brand new industry or sector, what experiences am I bringing with me? What history is there? Now, if you're fortunate enough or unfortunate enough, depending on how you look at it, to buy a business, then you're wanting to basically bring that history with you. They want to go and understand their accounts, their customer numbers. A range of opportunities to turn around and take that business forward. How are you going to change it? How are you going to develop it? So once you've kind of told the individual that's reading this of about you, about the business, Tell me about what market research you've done. Now, this is one of the worst areas ever completed within a business plan. You know, you've got so much experience of your marketplace. You've got so much experience of the market around you. Make sure it's in the business plan. This is what's going to back up what you think your sales are going to be. Business Gateway is a fantastic research section, which you can go and look at. There's individual um, market sector information within the Business Gateway website. We've also got a market research team who basically can support you as well. Speak to your Business Gateway um, team or basically reach out, look in the website and you will find the phone number there for the market research team as well. Who are your customers? And how are you going to reach them? You know, it's great saying I'm going to build the world's greatest website or Instagram account, but actually what is your marketing plan to make people aware of that? Is it direct mail? Is it face to face? Is it um, developing um, a massive social media output? Is it getting a, an influencer on board? But before you do all that, you need to understand your customer. Who are they? What are they? What age are they? What demographic are they? Where do they come from? What money have they got left over at the end of the week? How often do they buy your product? Now that neatly brings you on to section seven, which turns around and says, well, wait a minute. Where are they buying it now? What products are already out there? Even if this is a brand new product you're bringing to the market, what alternative is out there? You know, if I explain it basically, I decide I'm hungry at the moment. I go down to the vending machine in this office and I have the choice of a bag of crisps or a Mars bar. They're not the same product. But look, taste, then and like each other. It's an alternative. So you need to start understanding what alternatives are being offered. Look at your competitors. Don't look at them through the prism of thinking they're rubbish. My view of competitors is if they've been in business for more than 10 years, two years, sorry, um, basically they're doing something right. 
somebody's buying from them on a regular basis. You then move on to section eight, which is legal obligations. What do you actually have to think about when you start this business up? What professional body do you need to be involved in? What trade body? Um, what um, legal obligations regarding the environment or, you know, anything else within your realm and regime, health and safety? Um, what other things do you need to think about that allows you to uh, that start up this business in its correct legal form? What you've completed there up to section eight is the word part of the document. What that needs to reflect is the financial side. So what's it going to cost to start up your business? Think through everything from the machinery you need, the premises you need, the vehicle you need, the tools you need, the, you know, if you're basically moving into an office, the photocopier. And then what's it going to cost you to basically look and manage this business for the first two or three months until the money starts coming in? What working capital do you need to turn around and take this business forward? And that does lead you into the financial appendices, usually an Excel spreadsheet, which again, there are templates available for. Biggest problem you're going to have is sales projections. How do you work out what your sales projections are going to be? You know, you're looking at it and turning and saying, well, let's just say you're a consultant or a or a joiner, sole trader, either or. When you start breaking down your month, you've got 30-ish days in a month, but actually you're not planning to work the weekend, so that takes you down to about 22 days a month. You've got your admin to do. You might want to take a couple of days holiday a month. And before you know it, you're probably down to 16 days of billable time a month. So there's your first sales projection parameter. 16 days times my day rate gives me how much I can earn in a month. Now, if you bring on more labour, you do things more efficiently, that's when you can start building up your sales projections. But, you know, using your market research data from Section 5, you're turning around saying, is this realistic? Can I achieve this? That immediately projects into your cash flow. Now, your cash flow is turning around and saying what money is going to come in when and what money is going to go out when. It's the timing of money. So you need to start looking, OK, fine, a sale does come in in the first of the month. When are they going to pay me? Is it 30 days immediately in cash? When does money come in and when does money go out? And what that will also do your cash flow is give you an indication of the gap. What gap? Have you got and from money you have to invest in the business and the money you need to both buy the startup costs and run the working capital for two or three months? Then there's profit and loss account. This tells you, are you going to make money or not? Now, many new businesses can run at a loss for a couple of years. That's truthfully normal. You know, it sometimes takes three years for a business to build up the point where they're actually making profit. I'm not saying you want to do that, but in the end of the day, that's what it's about. So what's the next thoughts? You're basically creating a profit and loss account, turn around and saying, what money have I got going to come in? What basically cost do I need to put out? Your costs are split into direct costs. So in other words, directly relating to the sale. So in other words, if you were selling a scone, it'd be the products, the raw materials, the wheat, the, the flour, sorry, the, the currants, the milk, the eggs, whatever it may be that basically takes you to make that product. And lastly, there's a balance sheet. And the balance sheet shows what the position of your financial health is in at any point in time. So it shows you your fixed assets, your current assets, current liabilities, and then it basically shows you what your reserves are. And lastly, you've done all that, and now you go back to stage one. You go back and you write the executive summary. How do I write executive summaries and business plans? I go into each of the sections I've just talked about and copy and paste the key points in the executive summary. And I then create my executive summary out of that. And that allows me then to have exactly what it says, a summary of the executive points. Other key thing here, one page. Because if your executive summary rambles on, it's starting, to, it's starting to basically tell you things that you should be seeing in section two and section four. 
So, folks, that's about, give or take, 15 minutes of me going on and telling you an overview of what business planning is. So I'm just going to have a quick look before we start in the Q&A, and I'm going to have a quick look at all the information in the chat. Thank you for everybody um, for basically uh, putting some stuff in the chat. We've got Anne, who's from Cruden Bay. Um, rainy Cruden Bay. Anne, I'll be honest, I've been in this building. I am assuming it's still raining outside. Um, so Susan's saying, I found that as a dyslexic, I find this a challenge. I can 100% agree with you, Susan. Um, other people are that have housed the dyslexic community supported. So from a business gateway point of view, now I cannot speak for every one of the um, business gateways across Scotland. I will tell you what we do in the regions we support. Um, we would actually support you to write that business plan for you. And um, we use a thing called expert help um, to basically support you in writing your business plan. Now, I cannot guarantee that that's done in every single business gateway um, Council, although roughly we kind of do cover the same topics. Um, but the reality is that's what we'd be doing for you. So we would actually be supporting you. And the end of the day is your business plan. So this is the one thing about business plans of getting somebody else to write it for you. They'll never write it in the exact way you want it written. So it is about you providing as much information as you can for us to then utilise that to develop your business plan. Um, but yeah, writing a business plan with dyslexia should not be a barrier in terms of the support business gate we can give to you. Um, so yeah, reach out to your business uh, gateway um, team, Susan. Um, very happy to, if you, if you want to message me and, and let me know which region you're in. Sorry, I don't think I picked that up, or if I did, I'm apologies. Uh, no, I don't. Um, Stan saying, um, yep, Stan's basically saying, apparently use of visuals can help if dyslexic picture can see a thousand words. Lean, yeah, lean canvas models, maybe. Yeah, um, just on pictures. Uh, I put pictures and images into business plans quite a lot. Um, I do exactly what Stan's just said there. Um, I'll give you the, the the example I always use, and this goes back a number of years. We were completing a business plan for what's called a regional selective assistance. It was for a brand new £600,000 laser cutter for metal. Um, I'll be honest, to try and explain what this cutter did, what the tip did, what various aspects of it did, um, I'll be honest, I struggled. I was trying to write it. I'm not you have to remember a business plan is not a mechanical document. It's not a scientific paper. It's a bit putting across what basically that um, machine would do for the business. And we were very, very fortunate. We found some images of the machine, of the tip, and we basically used those to enhance the wording we had. And it basically read very well. And thankfully, the company did get their grant funding. So Susan's saying, I use visuals as dyslexic, I use assistive technology, I understand big picture thinking, how to break that down, how to support people in the neurodiverse community, words and cost is a problem. As I say, Susan, I'll just excuse sound like a politician here, I'll refer back to my previous answer. Um, yeah, honestly, come back to Business Gateway and have a chat. Um, Marlon's saying, doing coaching via Zoom, Marlon and I have met before on, on a couple of courses. Uh, government department must register if I'm holding information about people. Do you know which department, please? So yeah, there's a couple of things there, Marlon. Um, one, somebody's mentioned making sure your your GDPR um, ready. So in other words, making sure um, that you are holding data um, on people correctly and basically within their their the rights that you've asked them for it. Um, good shout out here for some of our webinars that are online. Um, you can go into some of the webinars from Business Gateway. If you get into B Gateway slash events, um, if you do that, basically you can um, find our online tutorials. Off the top of my head, uh, there was about 25, 30 of them. I'm sure they're growing by the day. There is two or three really good ones in GDPR in there. The other organisation you should register with, and it will cost you, I want to still say it's about £35, is the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, <clears throat> it's a strange little registration. You register with them, but basically what you're then saying is that you're meeting the guideline requirements of what they're stating um, in terms of how you keep information. Um, the Information Commissioner's Office is where, um, let's just say there was a data breach, that's where it ends up. and um, That's who's informed. Um, 
Yeah, exactly, Susan. I mean, there's a number of ways in terms you can look at GDPR for regulation um, and how long you keep that data for, what's the purpose of that data and how you're going to use it. Um, Anne's asking what's been Canvas. I am going to be corrected here, possibly. There is a, such a thing as a business model Canvas, which is a really straightforward business planning model. It's a tool that you can download. It basically, instead of writing a business plan the way I would not naturally write a business plan, business model Canvas takes you through, and I want to say seven or eight sections, I'll quickly try to count them up in my head, um, and takes you through a different approach as into why you're doing a business plan, what you're doing it for, looks at your marketing, looks at your customers. So it just looks, it maybe gets rid of a lot of the wording that basically is required, um, and it kind of takes you through a journey to, to allow you to build up what your business is, who it's for, and where you're going to go. So it is a different tool, tool and technique um, to be used. So I think I've covered all the meeting chat. Now, what I'm interested in now is um, we're roughly halfway through. We're not really halfway through, but we're roughly halfway through. Um, I'm really looking for questions. I'm looking for uh, questions, anecdotes, what are you using your business plan for? Have you got into your business plan and you're just stuck? So basically, open your mics up, fire on in. I'm very happy to take as many questions as you can fire at me. Stick them in the chat if you don't want to open your mic up. You know, just talk away to me. Oh, there's 20. Hello, who's that? Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, as a sole trader, just interested in how much information you would put in section two versus section four when it comes to history of how you got into the business or why you're doing what you're doing, just to understand a little bit more detail of not saying the yeah. same twice and not leaving important mm. stuff out. No, so if you think about Section two is about the business near enough, and section four is about you. Um, so that makes it easy. I'll, I'll, I'll caveat that a little bit. So really, um, yeah, quite simple. You know, what is your business? What's your service? Uh, you know, we read, I mean, genuinely read dozens upon dozens of business plans a month. And sometimes you're sitting about page 14, and you're still trying to work out, actually, what is this business doing for me? What does it actually do for a living? You haven't understood what the product is. You haven't understood what their service is. They haven't given you an indication of how they're going to sell it. And you're just really struggling to work out what they're selling. And then this is where a business plan falls down because in section two, you don't tell the reader what you're selling in any great depth. The reader then eventually, if they can, you know, I hate saying if they've reached a point they, they still want to read on, they'll go to the financials and you'll list all these services or products you're going to sell. And they're thinking, but wait a minute, none of that was mentioned back in the business plan itself. So immediately what you've got is you've got the, the heckles up on them. They're thinking, mm, things are only tying up here. So the key thing is just, and it isn't, it isn't a list, it's about really turning around and saying, what are these services? What did they do for somebody? What's the benefit to my client? You know, um, and this, this goes for any sector, you know, whether it's a cafe and where it's positioned. Now, at this point, you could, for example, add in, if you're buying over a cafe, you know, what the previous accounts were, what the footfall was, are they busy during school term and not so busy, or do they do outside catering, or do, are they well known because it's a, a great place to go for afternoon tea? So you can tell a little bit of that. Then section four is about you. It's about you, your history. You can also, as I say, link into maybe the staff you're going to bring with you, the people that's going to be around you. It can also look at advisors. So, you know, as a sole trader, you're not alone. So you're first of all, you know, let's make this easy. Your first person you, let, you mentioned maybe in there's your business gateway advisor, your accountant, your bank manager, your lawyer. If you're going to be building a building, your planning expert, your quality surveyor, your architect, it's not just about you personally, it's about who's around you. Your partner may be a specialist in something and you want to bring them in. You want to say, well, actually, my grandmother, now retired, um, ran a successful business for the past 30 years and she's going to be my mentor. 
So if you can imagine that there, there's a whole range of things, because what we're not wanting to see is that you're not telling us about the experience you've got as a team. Now, it's fine if you're a, um, you know, if you're a larger business or you're buying into a larger business, that team's already kind of there. And what you'd want to do then is you want to say, well, Jimmy is my manager, Sarah's my supervisor. They've been with the business for five years and they've achieved X, Y and Z. Um, you know, so there's a whole range of things in there um, that you could basically bring into those two sections. I hope that helped. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, that's great. So Fiona's asked, um, thanks Stan, by the way, for, change, for sharing that um, link. I'll need to go and look at that myself. Um, Fiona's asking exactly the same for a community business. Um, Fiona, yeah, we use the exact same model for a community business that we do for a, a private business. Now, there are some differences in that, uh, and I'll kind of take you through these. The slight differences, and they're actually slowly merging together. So if you go back three, four years ago, when I was writing a business plan for a private business, I'll be honest, what were we interested in? We were interested in economic impact. We were interested in product growth business growth, service growth, profitability, number of employees. I'm sure there was a few more, but, you know, give or take, that's what we were interested in. That's what kind of ticked the boxes for the people reading business plans. From a business point of view now, what we've done is, and we're seeing this more and more in our, our actual true large business plan template we utilise on a day-to-day -day basis contains this now. We're actually challenging the businesses to look completely different at themselves because when we look at grants, we look at loans, we look at funding opportunities in a private sector, and I will come on to the community in a second, um, there is a lot more out there that basically are wanting more than just profit. They're now looking to see what impact are you having in the local supply chain? Are you using local suppliers? Are you basically... Um, treating your workers well? Are you basically bringing on opportunities for apprenticeships? Are you basically paying the real living wage? I mean, we've got grant funders now that will not give to a business unless they're real living wage accredited. Um, what are you doing within your community? You know, what are you giving back to your community? So what we've done, and it's not on the template I've shown you there, we now add in by near our default, a whole range of things from fair working practices to place-based economics to community wealth building, etc., that allow us to make sure we meet the requirements of many grants and funders. So what's happened is that business plan template is much, much closer now than it was previously to one I would do for um, a community organisation, social enterprise, charity. Because obviously, when you're a charity, profit's not your number one target. I'm a great, by the way, I'm not a fan of the word not for profit. I believe every social enterprise community must have surplus, as we call it in that sector. Um, it's not profit, it's surplus, because you need that surplus to invest. But we always look to other things. And literally exactly what I've said is, and we would go deeper into like community consultation. So there'd be probably an extra section in there about community consultation. What have you went out and asked the community? And is this what they want? Um, secondly, the other thing is with community, um, many times in private business, we will be doing a, a business plan for a specific fund, grant, loan from a specific organisation. Whereas in the community, um, what we normally find is that most projects within a social enterprise or charity are funded through a number of sources. It could be a bit from the council, a bit from the National Lottery, your trust, local wind farm, community benefit fund. Well, there's an issue because when we write a business plan, we write it for the funder. So we will go and find that funder and who they are and what their, what their requirements are, and we'll kind of tailor the business plan to them. So what we normally do if we were writing a business plan for you, we would write, the, write it for a specific funder, but the community business plan is then going to have to be altered to basically meet the requirements 
of any other funders you send it to. So we call a skeleton plan. We basically hand you a skeleton plan and it's basically from there on, whatever funder you're going to have or going to go to, you can update it. So it is more community-based. It is more about the work you've done in the community, the deliverables, the outcomes, than it is, say, on a, on a, on a private business plan. But um, as I say, whereas they used to be very far apart, they're getting a lot closer now world these days, to be honest. Um, and saying, I'm winding up one sole trader business due to COVID and launching another. I seem to be writing a business type plan for, for the business wind up. Is that normal or daft? Is there a plan to work through for business wind up? And that's a cracking question. I've, um, we've never written a business plan per se for a business wind up. We have written um, processes and direction for right winding up businesses. Um, the benefit you've got by doing what you're doing is, you know, winding up a business seems easy. You just kind of shut the doors and walk away, but that's not quite how it operates. Obviously, you've got things, a whole range of things to think about. Um, this is just out of my background. I literally treat every new business, every business we have to wind up, every growth opportunity as a project. Um, so therefore, winding up a business, sadly, and launching another is just two projects in my world, and that's how I look at it. So near enough, I wouldn't call it a business plan for winding up. I would near enough call it a kind of project brief, um, etc. And what you're doing is making sure that you've covered all the angles. Have you got all the money back from any debtors that's owed? Have you paid off all your creditors? Do you owe HMRC money? Um, have you basically filed your last self-assessment, making sure in time? Now, obviously, you're about to start a new sole trading business. So a lot of that, you know, you would do a self-assessment anyway, it'll just continue. So no, definitely not daft. Um, maybe just don't call it a business plan. Um, it's a wind-up project brief or worse to that effect. But obviously, what you might want to do, and this is something to think about when you're launching your new business, when you're writing your business plan for that, what you're trying to make sure is that, and, you know, be, be open. I'll come back to that in a second. But what you're trying to do in your business plan is to turn around and say, OK, let's put the lessons learned from my previous business and COVID into this business plan and tell the people what I've learned, how we are going to learn from things that we did in the past and how we're going to change things. What I was saying about openness is, um, right, a bit like fudging your CV. Don't fudge a business plan. Um, we are in such a small community in Scotland, it's so easy to go and find things out. Um, you don't massage numbers. You basically make them quite conservative. You, because in the end of the day, you know, um, I'm a great believer in openness. So what, what what you do in your business plan is say, do you know something? Yeah, we had a business plan. I'm not saying it's the first thing you're going to tell them. We had a business, didn't quite work out. We've now basically started this other one and we've learned from it by X, Y, and Z. It's probably better that than halfway through a funding conversation that the, the funder brings it up to you. So, you know, as I say, it's not headline fig. It wouldn't be in my executive summary. It'll be somewhere down in that section four we talked about, about you, your experience. I wouldn't be bigging it up, let's say. But, you know, it's definitely something I would be including in um, in your new business plan for your launching another. Because trust me, every day is a school day. Tons of times for questions, guys. Anything at all. Colin, it's Marlon Hello, again. Marlon. How, are you? Uh, How are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you. <laughs> I want you to tell me and, and the others if, if this seems staffed or not. Um, I ran a, a, a training and a coaching consultancy from 2001 up until COVID when it went bust overnight because we couldn't trade. Um, yes. And I'm going back to my coaching, not so much the training. I coached in, in business pre-COVID, fine, and so I want to open that up again, McLaughlin coaching yep. business, but during, while, while I was off, while I wasn't working since lockdown, but I've been studying yes. and I've taken it ahead and I've uh, qualified as a, a life coach and also as a, a, a counsellor specialising yes. in couples counselling, 
But I want to open that under a separate name and keep it totally separate. I did a lot of um, motivational coaching for my voluntary group that I worked with for donkey's years. And I learned there that the people who came for my residential weekends on self-esteem motivation never got all my details because I discovered that people, uh, they had informed me that people cling to you like a life raft once you've helped yep. them. So they, they, they weren't yep. allowed to get my contact details. They had to contact me through the headquarters of the organisation. So I was yep. going to open that up separately under my, my maiden name and the last part of my own name, so it would be Lynn Henderson. Yep. Um, does, does that make sense? Is, or am I being yes. daft here? No, not at all. I mean, from, I'll start off with the boring bit in terms of HMRC, etc. I'm assuming they're two self and self sole trader businesses. Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, from from a boring point of view, the the kind of paperwork, quite simply, all you'll do is when you're doing your your final um, your self assessment return. You'll literally, when it drops down the box, you'll put in there how many sole trading businesses you have. You'll have two, and that'll basically give you the opportunity on the self-assessment to split them out, if that's what you want to do. Um, given the fact, definitely not a daft idea. I, I, I'm a great believer that confusion can reign sometimes, especially if you're trying to do two types of businesses um, under the one umbrella. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I mean, you know, we do a number of services under one umbrella, but at the same time, um, the reality says is that from a completely separation, making the accounts this different, the way you market different, the way you, you know, prime example is that you may, and I'm not saying you here, but, you know, take my business. I may want to market in one day to brand new startup businesses, but in the next day, I want to market to corporate clients. So actually, that's two totally different marketing streams. It's two totally different approaches. So really what I want to turn around and do is separate those two businesses out, make them their own unique brand, make them their own unique business plan, their own unique vision to turn around and see to make sure we can get as much out of that marketplace as possible. Given the complete distinctiveness of your two offerings there, to have them as two separate businesses to me makes a lot of sense. Now, there's no tax benefit to this. There's no et cetera, VAT benefit or anything like that at the moment. This is just about branding, marketing, and as you say, in your instance, and it doesn't happen to me, but you know, I basically turn around saying, actually, I want to keep this separate because I don't want them clinging to me. Um, you know, so to me, I think you're going down the exact correct route, to be honest, um, because to me, it's two completely different offerings, um, and, and I don't think they, you want them merging to be honest because it, the problem is the minute you merge them in any way or have them through one business your anonymity in the second one will, will completely disappear yeah because i was looking to do my my business coaching via the likes of linkedin and the chambers yep. of commerce and yeah. my uh, my life coaching type coaching via um social media not LinkedIn, but the other social medias. And I mean, this is where, you know, you start looking at your marketing strategy and turn around and say, well, obviously the, the, the Chamber of Commerce and Ayrshire is, is large, very large. It's a, it's a very, very well structured, with its new CEO, I want to just say, and congratulations to Claire Baird, um, very, very well deserved. Um, but, you know, the reality says is that it's a very, very well structured, organised, professional group. And that's the type of people you get there. At the same time, LinkedIn, that's exactly what it's for. And LinkedIn is a, is a valuable tool to reach to that type of community. Whereas truthfully, um, you know, Business Gateway, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube works unbelievably well for us because we're trying to get that vast community um, access. But you're right, for the second part of your business, um, you know, would YouTube work? Would Instagram work? TikTok work? Probably not for a professional services company. Um, whereas basically for the other side of your business, yeah, that's your marketing stream. And as I say, the minute you start getting those mixed up, yeah, you've got a, you've got a very strange message going out. So yeah, keeping them keeping them different to me works a treat. Thank you. Cheers, Marlon.
Guys, keep it coming. Now, a couple of things just to say. Um, there will be a survey link for feedback coming out. I actually got it in the next slide, I think, actually, before I before I kind of stopped um, showing the slides. Or I know you'll still see them, but um, moving them. I don't know whether I can just, just two seconds, let me. There we go. Um, so there will be a feedback link coming out um, from the organisers. Um, if you would be very kind to uh, fill that in, that'd be really appreciated. Um, I haven't got a timeline when that's coming out. Sorry, just two seconds to shut that off. Um, you know, but the reality is if you could just spend the 20, 30 seconds filming that in, it would be really appreciated. It'll feed back into us in terms of the, the type of things you want, basically put on at Scottish Business Week, and it'll allow us to basically improve over the coming um, years to come. Uh, guys, we've still got time. Very, very happy to um, basically keep taking questions. If there's anything at all within the, the kind of realm of financial management and business planning. <clears throat> I'm going to do a couple of things then just to kind of turn around and, 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 and this is not a oh there you go <clears throat> how you doing excuse me a ah, couple of more questions that's great so um somebody's saying sorry i don't know what your first name is apologies you're just coming up as an email address um person saying i'm late to the business plan game i've never created one per se do we need them in order to grow your business um do you no okay there's the easy answer however without a plan one, how do you know where you're getting to? So in other words, if you don't have a vision, you don't have an aim, you don't have something you want to reach, then basically, you know, how do you know when you've actually reached where you want to reach in your business? Secondly, um, a business plan is a very, very good way of plotting that out and understanding before you actually get into the real world, before you have to spend money to do things, of trying to work out what is the impact. You know, you turn around and you look at premises. Does that fit your need? You know, you basically look at your business plan, you develop your business plan, you see where you're going. You're going to have four employees, you hope, by the end of month 18. You're going to work in your home for at least the first six months. What size of premises do I need? What, who's going to come into that premises? You, basically, you keep asking yourself questions. And by doing the business plan and getting it on paper, you actually start to read it back to yourself. It's great. You can develop a business plan in your head. But once you get it on paper, you've kind of locked it and sealed it. You know, so to me, getting a business plan to help grow your business isn't enough essential. Because it just maps out all those issues that you might be facing and basically allows you without cost, without real life, putting mitigations in place. Hope I help. Amanda has just asked, how much market research do you need? I'm an unbelievably great believer in market research. Um, market research comes from various ways, primary, secondary resources, and you. So first of all, you're going to basically take everything you know about your industry and basically put it on the table into the business plan. After that, what you really want to make sure is you know your local marketplace. Now, let's assume you are a local business and you're not going to be trading nationally. But, you know, get to know your local business place. Who's the alternatives? Who's the competitors? Get to understand the basic details of your marketplace, the ages, demographics. Where do they live? Are they willing to walk 10 minutes to your shop? Whatever it may be. You know, who are your potential customers? How do they react to marketing? In other words, are they going to be there for direct marketing or are they basically going to be quite happy to see an advert on Facebook? Do you need to basically go and, go and speak to them face to face? Do you need to go and put a flyer through their door? Do you need to arrange a meeting? How do you get that meeting? How do you do the introduction? So there's a lot of primary market research you can do. Then secondary market research, where basically you go to people like Business Gateway Market Research Team and turn around and say to them, OK, 
I am looking for industry analysis. I am looking for market trends. I'm looking for information on my marketplace. The more you can get, the better. Now, when you're taking that into a business plan, you may get sent 40, 50 pages of market research from the market research team. You've all your own stuff as well. I'm not looking for 40, 50 pages of market research within your business plan. What I'm looking for is the nuggets, the little important aspects that basically you look at when you're reading the market research and you say, that's it. I now know where my niche is. I now know what my client base is. I know where they are, how we can attract them. Bring all that into your market research page within your business plan. Now, if there's a, a great survey, for example, you've found or actually completed, stick it in the appendix at the end. Because when you're writing a business plan, the last thing you want is to keep reading, 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 reach your market research section, and you've got 12 pages of a, a survey in there. It just puts the reader off. It destroys the flow. So what you're then on to is if the person who's reading it wants to read further and more market research, you can direct them to Appendix 1 and they can take that decision, but don't force it on them. So you're looking for these little, really true, important facts. I mean, I'll give you, and this is years ago, I was doing a business plan for a, a cafe, which was actually a, attached to a national charity. They were building an extension in the building to give them more room, but there's also going to be a cafe available for both internal staff, people passing by because there was a park near them, and also um, their guests and clients that basically come in the building. It was a busy building. And yeah, love coffee, love tea, love cake. But the reality is what I never appreciated, and this is a long time ago, how much hot chocolate was sold in cafes and how big a thing it was at the time. Now, it could still well be, I can't remember. I haven't done it for a while. Um, but that just changed the way we looked at basically how this cafe would operate, what it sold, how it sold things. That little nugget of information basically meant that you expanded the menu, basically, to include different types of that type of, of, of product base. Now, that's all it takes, that little bit of market research. So my belief is that if you look at your market research in the round, you've got your gut feel, you've got primary market research you've done, and you've got secondary market research you've received. And if all three of those are heading in the right direction, and it's telling you roughly the same thing, then you've probably got something good. So sorry, Amanda, I cannot basically give you a specific answer, but it's enough to just prove the sales figures that you think you're going to achieve and the potential growth is the answer. Silence. Any other questions? Anything you want to ask? Guys, as I say, if another question pops up, very happily ask, answer it um, just as you think through. Oh, great. Is it better to have a professional assistance to create your business plan? It depends what you're going for. Um, I'll include Business Gateway in that professional assistance. I will basically stick that hat on. Um, if you've got the opportunity of assistance, please take it. Um, you know, by the way, it's probably worthwhile saying we do offer business planning webinars as well on Business Gateway national webinars. So if you're looking for a more in-depth version of this, um, please do. Um, please do go to bgateway.com and, and find those events. Um, In the end of the day, depending what you're after, depending on the scale and size of your business plan, do you need to bring in somebody professional? Um, to me, a business plan can be written by you without an issue because we've got tools, we've got templates, we've got information you can get directly from Business Gateway. So there is no problem in you writing that business plan. Um, as long as that's within your, your capabilities. Um, the only thing I would turn around and say is the problem with business plans is no matter what the, the final size of it is, 
it's quite daunting. You know, you're back at school, you're writing essays here. So you're turning around and saying, well, actually, make sure if you are writing it on your own, that you look at it from a, a page by page, section by section. Don't look at it as a whole, because if, if not, it'll just overwhelm you, the amount of information you need. Work your way slowly through each section, and you will end up with actually quite a professional business plan. Why do you need to bring a when do you bring professionals in? You know, and the reality is if you're after quite a large loan, you're after quite a large grant, you're having to do that business plan to convince a supplier you can you can meet their requirements and it's unbelievably strategically important to you, it may be time to call in the professionals to do really detailed analysis, good financial quality forecasts, making sure that the business plan and the financial forecasts tie in. So Again, sorry, I'm not giving a straight answer. There is no straight answer. I think it depends on the severity of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, we really are at a point of turning around and making sure that are you going to put that one chance business plan in front of the correct individual? Um, also asked, how often should you look at reviewing your business plan and updating it if required? So a couple of answers to this. Um, I've been doing regular at least six monthly reviews of your business plan. That's the word section. So I'd be making sure that it's regularly updated. What's your new vision? What's your new strategy? What's your new direction? From there, let's take the financial side. As I say, to me, a business plan is a living document and your financials actually become your way of monitoring your success in the coming months and weeks. So basically what happens is, you build your 12, 14, sorry, 14, 12, 24 month forecast, and you then use that to match against what your actuals are. So your actuals come in on your month to month basis, and you look at where you think you were going to be, and you see what's worked well and what hasn't. You then use that new actual number to reforecast to see where you're going to be, and you keep what I call a rolling forecast going. So to answer your question in two halves, from a financial point of view, monthly. From a, a work point of view, maybe every three, six months to have a look at it to see you're, you're hitting your, your targets. Katie, if you're around, I'm just want to make sure you're you're just coming back in as we kind of come to the end of this, just to make sure I'm leaving correctly. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> All right, Katie, just wanted to Hello. check. I just didn't want yeah. to hit, hit the leave button and everybody oh, just fine. disappears. And... No, um, they, won't, <laughs> they won't disappear because I'm still here. So. <laughs> That's fine. Um, um, as I say, I'm still very happy to take questions. We've still got two or three minutes left, but um, if not, you know, if there are no more questions, can I just say thank you very much for this? Um, one, it's been a, a joy doing the, another um, exercise in uh, basically the, the uh, Scottish Business Week. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you very much for all the input as well. It makes life a lot easier at this side of the table as well when I get good questions and it allows me to answer them. Um, and can I say best wishes to whatever you're doing in your business, whether it's a brand new startup or a growth business, and uh, all of you take care, have a great day, and best wishes.